And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Strange Owl Games, Current, currently putting forward Space 1889 after. The, a the after part is important. The one and only John Matthew DeFoggy. How are you doing tonight, man? I am doing wonderful. Thanks for having me on. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's warmer where you are than it is where I am. Um, we got, we're in the, I think we're now in the forties and we had a high of 50 today, but you're, uh, you're much further North than I am. So, mm -hmm. and you have this thing called wind chill that I just, we don't deal with anymore down here. You, you ever hear the phrase, it's not, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. <laughs> yeah. I've always said to people, it's not the cold, it's the wind chill. That's right. But that's right. It's been... It's been high 20s, low th low 30s for most of the day, uh, and is probably going to stay in the 30s for the, for the rest of the week. Oof. I do not miss that about the northern Midwest. Uh, although, fortunately, the snow there's plenty of snow on the ground, which means I have plenty of ammo to hassle my roommate. There you go. <laughs> You know, make make it so that the make it so that the walk up the driveway is as perilous as I can make it, or in some or in some cases, some cases just getting out of bed. I've done, I've done the gag of um getting of getting a bunch of lunch trays and putting them around, filling them with snow and putting them around someone's bed. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you step up, you step out of bed, and the first thing you're stepping in is half melted snow. Yeah, that uh, that'll wake you up quick. <laughs> so. I like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Sure. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. So, my first introduction to role-playing games was um, back in, I want to say, fifth grade. Uh, a buddy of mine, Angel, was like, hey, I got this book, and I don't know what it is. I'll trade you uh, this book uh, for your for your lunch money. And it was this weird book. It had a superhero on the cover kind of flying off. And it was the Palladium Heroes Unlimited Revised Edition. And I read that book and I made characters for about two years, never realizing it was a game. I thought it was just a... Because the Palladium rule system, especially for somebody in fifth grade, was... I think it was a matter of it, the layout as opposed to actually the text. Palladium but, has been my whipping boy for a reason. Um, so I got to I got to middle school, and this guy came and sat down at my at my lunch table. And was like, "Hey, you guys want to play this game? Uh, it's called GURPS." And I was like, "Sure." And we played it, and two things happened, or three things. One, I fell in love with the idea of role playing games. Mm -hmm. Two, suddenly everything I read in Heroes Unlimited made sense now, having actually like experienced. And three. I was pretty sure I could run a better game than the guy who just ran a game for us at lunchtime. And so the next day I was like, can I try this? And basically I've been running games ever since. So you're a forever GM. Got it. I am a forever GM, but by choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I've jokingly said over the years, one of, one of these days I need to set up a, um, set up a forever GM anonymous group. You mm -hmm. know, like Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm-hmm. Welcome, Game Master. Um, yeah. So I then, you know, after, oh man, more decades than I'd like to admit, uh, I started writing uh, mm -hmm. for role-playing games. Did a, did a couple of things during the 4th edition era uh, with some friends, and then... 4th edition uh, we GURPS were, or 4th edition D&D? 4th edition D&D. I actually published a small adventure and player's guide uh, for a small region of my world uh, with a a uh, buddy of mine, uh, Bob Crum, who is working with us on Space 1889. Mm -hmm. And we did that. On, it's on drive-thru still, I think. Uh, the Ashen Sands of Agandos. 
And after that, I got into, uh, as I was chatting with you earlier, I wrote a fate supplement, uh, two fate supplements called uh, Shadowcraft and then the Shadowcraft Missions Guide. And then I got involved with 13th Age. I, I am the line developer for 13th Age. Ended up publishing my own Bronze Age role-playing game with Osprey, Jackals, and now I'm doing Savage Worlds. Or not Savage Worlds. I am doing uh, Space 1889 with Strange Owl Games. Mm -hmm. Now, Space 1889 has had a very interesting history. And there seems to be, th there seems to be this weird thing going on where... Any game that came out of GDW went through system hopping over the years. Right. Um, obviously, Traveler is the big one to the point where I, for the longest time, refused to review Traveler because I was thinking, how the hell am I going to summarize all the um, rule set, cha all the rule set jumping over the past forty years? Right. And then you have T5, which is essentially just a game designer's manual. I'm not entirely convinced. My buddy Gabe. Let me look through it. I'm not entirely uh, convinced it's a coherent game. It's a bunch of mini games that you can pick and choose. I I joke I had jokingly I jokingly sa said if if my channel hits a thousand subs I will I will review either um, T5.1 or Mongoose Second Edition, and oh, I nice. put it up to a vote. Mongoose Second Edition won by a landslide, so that's the <laughs> one I picked because democracy. There you go. I was half afraid that some people were going to pick T5.1 just to mess with me. It's a beast. It, it I um for the longest time I had made I had made jokes about needing a T83 in order to make vehicles and GURPS. I think this I think that can apply <laughs> with T5. Yeah, probably. Now, Space 1889 has ha has has done has gone through its own system jumping, but not not as crazy. Because it's it's only done it it's only done it twice. Uh, there was there was um red there was red sands which mm -hmm. used Savage World, and then there then there was the uh, space eighteen eighty nine that used the ubiquity system because apparently Germany really loves space eighteen eighty nine. Yes. And now and now we and now we have. After, which yes. So I so I suppose the first thing to go into is how f is um were you familiar at all with any with any of the previous editions of Space? Um, I had always been aware of Space eighteen eighty nine, and I believe I had the Red Sands books because I am a completionist uh, when I collect role playing games. And I had read through it, and I really enjoyed the uh, the idea of it. I mean, I enjoyed Jules Verne and H.G. Mm -hmm. Wells, and you know, all of the sort of you know, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and and mm -hmm. all of the um, tales that fed into that. But my first real experience playing or running Space eighteen eighty nine was when uh, Strange Owl Games we got the license to do it. Um, Daryl Hayhurst of uh, who's now with Pinnacle, did the game design, and he and Rachel Savicki uh, updated the the setting. And you know, I've run quite a bit of it. I'm running it on my my stream right now mm -hmm. on Twitch for uh, you know to kind of show off this new uh, Imperium edition. And I gotta say, I've really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Now that does this is this is where things get a bit interesting because the the last ver the last version which i mentioned already used mm -hmm. the ubiquity system which right my first introduction to that system was hollow earth expedition yeah and of course it is a interesting setup even though even though um it's going to have a it it's elephant in the room is going to be how it uses dice well, but for fortunately there is, fortunately there is dice stickers but that's a that can be a bit of a cold comfort, depending on the table. Right. Um, obviously, that's not as much of an issue these days when everybody's using virtual tabletop and dice rollers. Right. But it is it is something to go with. Now, as I understand it, the imp with this Empyrean system, mm -hmm. you have a die pool and you have a d20. So I'm I'm curious what the all roads lead to Rome kind of 
die mechanic is going to be. So essentially, the the all of your your skill checks. So we call them uh, rolls and saves. Mm-hmm. That this kind of harkens back to the old GD. Uh, w system. So you have your abilities. They're rated between one and five, and that's how many d sixes you roll. And five generates one, what uh, Daryl calls a good, and a six generates two, and adds an additional die to your die pool. And so you're looking for at least one. You're looking for at least one uh, success to succeed at a task. And then you can spend pairs of successes after that to get additional information, activate additional effects in combat. Mm-hmm. Your weapons will always have a pair um, ability that goes off. And one of the interesting things is Daryl has the, the way that Daryl has the rules were written is in combat, if you only roll two successes, you can choose to activate the pair effect and not do damage. So if your weapon has something that causes like bleeding, you can choose to do that as opposed to the immediate damage. Mm-hmm. The D20 we call the danger die, and really you're only rolling it. Um, you can roll it during character creation to generate some randomized choices, but in general, the danger die is only rolled um, for you know to see how badly you're wounded, to see what area of your ship is hit. It's really only rolled when something bad is happening to the character. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to when it comes to that d20, is it a is it a case of you're tr- you're trying to roll odds or evens, or are you is it so is it's it roll? Different? Let me pull it up. Uh, it's it's really if you're trying to roll uh, low is all. If I remember correctly, this will probably be easier if I just pull up the the book. Uh, rolling low is generally worse in this game on the on the danger die. So for example, when you are wounded, uh, you take. You when when you are injured, you roll a uh, on the wound table, and every additional injury you have is how many extra d twenty you roll, and you're always looking for the lowest number. So if you're you know if you get wounded three times and you're rolling three d twenty, you have to pick the lowest one, and the you know on a one is when you is when you expire. Mm-hmm. Now take now of course the next thing that I'd have to co- I'd have to cover is character creation and obviously we would obviously going through the entirety of character creation is get is going to be a bit is going to be a bit of a moot thing uh or rather not not moot per se but uh we would end up being here for quite for quite a while so yeah. you can back back with ubiquity you kind of had a broad a broad combination of archetypes but not necessarily cla- not necessarily classes and not necessarily freeform either. Right. Um are you go- are you going with a sim- are you going with a similar approach when it comes to character creation in after? So character creation can be done one of two ways. Uh you can you always pick your species and then you can do a point by to make the character you want or you can pick uh one of our kind of pre-packaged point buys uh, that just allow you to get right to playing uh, playing the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, they're not classes because, again, as you level up, you're getting additional build points. So if you pick one of the, one of the professions, really all you're doing is saying, here's my starting point. And we've made it uh, simple enough that you can, if you wanted to, you could just roll a d20 and a d6, and that would give you your your profession, which gives you, you know, tells you how your abilities were were picked, what distinctions you have, what your starting gear is, and you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. Now, with the with that in mind, whenever you have character creation that's somewhat freeform, there's always a risk of analysis paralysis as i as i like to call mm-hmm. it so with that in mind even even with even in this empyrean version of the rule set do you have plans on put on putting some got on putting some guided archetypes so that people don't get too yeah, so lost early on if you right if you pick a career if you if you don't know what you want to do on your first character i highly recommend picking a career and basically there are uh, 10 careers and each career has three paths so you roll a d20 for your career a d6 for your path 
And if you're playing, you know, say you rolled a four and a three, you're playing a criminal who's a burglar. And that gives you, it tells you what your abilities are. It spends all of your build points for you. So it sets your abilities, it sets your cascades and distinctions and gives you all of your starting uh, gear. So, I mean, really, if you, if you have a GM who can explain the setting and let everyone pick their species and just say, hey, for our first game, everybody roll to kind of see what you would start with and, you know, allow people to kind of shift things around if they really want something else. You can be playing in under a half hour just because, you know, roll for your career and see what you get. Mm -hmm. So with that, with that in mind, I'd like to, would it be too much to ask for you to go for you to um, give me an example of a of a career and path just to kind of see sure. what that would entail? Sure. So let's take a look at uh, the detectives. So the detectives, I mean, obviously Arthur Conan Doyle is somebody we're drawing from. Mm -hmm. uh, so the detective career path gives you a little introduction to what a detective means in Victorian in a Victorian setting. And your three choices are a consultant, a scout, and a vigilante. So if you're a consultant, it gives you a little blurb on what a private consulting detective is. And then it says, okay, your abilities are uh, charm, combat, dash, discipline, endure, and science at two, mm -hmm. and sense at four, and sneak at three. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a cascade, which is a... Uh, it's sort of like a skill, but in in Space 1889, you're always rolling your abilities. If you don't have an appropriate cascade, you have to remove a success from your final total. Mm -hmm. So he's got the cascade for firearm. They get the distinctions, which are like special abilities, investigator and scholar. And then their assets are a favor they can call in, mm -hmm. a magnifying goggles, notebook, leather outfit, and a sword cane. And... You're ready to go. You just notate all of those down on your character sheet. You uh, you you pick two traits and your species, and you know you're ready to roll. Yeah. Now, in some in some cases, species, race, what what have you, mm -hmm. um, ends up ends up playing a bit of a role early on, but not but not so much later on. What what does one's choice of species add to the table? So in Space 1889, the species come with two things that are going to really keep you. Uh, I mean, they're gonna they're gonna define a lot of your play experience because they're gonna give you properties that no one else has in the game. So automatons start with armor because they're made of metal. Drobates start with telepathy because they're all telepathic. Mm -hmm. um, the Karagans, which are a uh, a creature, uh, or one of the species on Mars, the uh, Karagans, they uh, they can fly. So no one else gets to fly in the game unless they have a jetpack, but they get to to fly in whatever atmosphere because they produce something similar to the same pro that has the same properties of as liftwood. So they're sort of anti; they have an anti gravity effect around them. So they're always going to have properties, and the properties are usually um, they're very distinctive to the species. The only one that I see that kind of comes up uh, a couple of times is the negative property uncanny, which just says, hey, you're so far removed from sort of baseline um, interactions that people find you a little off. Like an automaton is never going to quite feel like talking to another living being and the senoates uh, which are um, these almost ant-like uh, insectoid creatures from the moon mm -hmm. they are also you're like well you have extra arms and you have mandibles I'm not really sure what how to interact with you uh, the other thing that is very much species dependent so if you pick a species uh, their power action is unique to them. And so if I can digress a little bit, in Space 1889, an exchange is uh, three rounds of combat. We've got an order deck that's numbered between 1 and 55. Mm -hmm. And you get five cards at the start of an exchange, and each round you play one of them as your initiative. Uh, lowest number goes first. 
the two twists on that is 1 to 15, because you're moving so fast, they trigger a risk in the scene mm -hmm. that targets your character. You're moving too fast to avoid a hazard. You don't see a trap. Something bad may happen to you because you're going that fast. On the flip side, 41 to 50 are what we call power actions. And the best example I can have of a power action is uh, the death machine's death ray powering up. Uh, they can only use that death ray on a power action. So everybody knows something bad is coming. Well, each species has their own action that they can take when they play one of these high initiative cards that's mm -hmm. definitely going to go last. So like the Karagan, they can swoop down and grab someone and shoot them up into the air and let them go. No one else gets to do that. An automaton can use a power action to reactivate themselves if they've been taken out of a fight. Mm -hmm. uh, the Drobates, which are the Moon Men, uh, they can use their telepathy to read the mind of an enemy and steal order cards from them so that they get more of them and their enemy has less. Mm -hmm. So that's those are species dependent. Like, because yeah. there's no trait, like the abilities are not tied to a species you're going to get less of that. I pick it because of what it gives me right at the beginning of a campaign and then basically ignore it for the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Now with that, with that in mind, you meant, you mentioned this, you mentioned the whole thing with the or with the order deck. Mm -hmm. um, is that a, is that a custom deck for, for the game or can it, or could you just as well use a standard playing card deck? Well, if you if you back the Kickstarter, the PDF deck is being produced, and uh, hopefully we hit the stretch goal where we are able to do, produce the physical deck. But yes, you can play with a standard um, deck of cards. We've got the rules in, written in there, so you uh, you know essentially you have the suits ordered in a specific way, and deal the cards out, uh, keep the jokers in, and that gets you to fifty. Four out of fifty-five, which is, you know, close enough for Jazz and Space eighteen eighty-nine. Mm -hmm. In other, in other words, good enough for government work. That's now, right. One of now, um, obviously, with a with a setting that wants to go that wants to go all in on this sort of classical high concept tech. We're we're gen we are gonna be having spaceships. We. It's you can't have space eighteen eighty nine without well space, so I have to I have to kind of ask how you guys will handle um, ship combat, especially since it can be easy to ha to have one player uh, managing a whole ship in certain combat encounters in other games. So I'm right. curious how you guys are going to avoid some of the traps of ship combat. Well, that's a great question. Let me uh, let me pull this up in the in my notes. So the way this works is there's still going to be the same amount of uh, same same setup in the exchange. You're going to have engagements, but essentially everyone is going to have a different operation that they get to take. Uh, you're going to be manning different posts, and Daryl's done a, a really great job of not making it uh, falling into the trap, as you said. Where, hey, the captain gets to do something, and the gunners get to shoot, and basically, that's kind of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so on a vehicle turn, all crew on the vehicle use the captain's order cards. All right? The ship always moves first, and the the actions then occur in any order the captain decides. So their job is to really say, hey, who is activating in what order during our ship turn? Mm -hmm. Each position, and so there are things like the captain, the deck, marines, engineers, officers, pilots, gunners, lookouts, uh, sailors, mm -hmm. people who are working the trim, and everybody has a different role that you can take. So... You know, the captain can help. All they get to do is help support other people and say, hey, here's the order we're doing this in. Yeah. Whereas the engineer, um, 
The engineer allows the ship to use their energy resources without consuming them because they're manning the engine. And if they make their roll on this turn, you're not using your ship's power resource because the engineer is directing power where it's need to be. There's mm -hmm. very little loss. Marines are constantly either trying to board or repel borders. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, that's kind of how he's worked that into this, is the idea that it's not individuals' turns, you're working together on a ship, and if you, there's nothing for you to do on your position, you have the option to support people as they're making their roles and give them dice and work with them on, on what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now, moving moving past that, given the, given the, no, given the notion that you get that you guys have in mind with um 1889 after it sounds it sounds like as a as a sequel to what to what came before some something happened that kind of cut off a lot of colonies from their host nations would that be yes. accurate that is accurate uh, so essentially there's there's been a lot of material as you said for Space 1889. There have been a lot of stories that have continued to push forward. And what we didn't want to have happen is, uh, there there are several settings that are very beloved to me, but they, they attended to do the same thing until recently, where they're like, hey, welcome to the new edition. It's back to year one. Looking Everything at you, L5R. Uh, yeah. <laughs> L5R, uh, Glorantha did this for a while, right? 1621 was kind of our, our default start date. Uh, thankfully, uh, the new version has moved it up and is continually to move it forward. So what Daryl and Rachel did is they basically said everything that happened in the previous Space 1889s has happened. Mm -hmm. But this event called the Poisoned Ether, where ships started to disappear, wreckage would show up in atmospheres of other planets, um, the ether became a dangerous place to travel, and at a certain point, no ship that left one planet ever arrived anywhere else. And for a a period of time, the planets were once again cut off to each other. And what was interesting for this is it also allowed them to go, all right, so what happens on, say, Venus when the Germans can't resupply their planet? Because the, the colonies were completely dependent on ether ships bringing in manufactured goods. Well, what happens when that gets cut off? What happens on Mars when uh, suddenly, you know, the British Navy can't come and reinforce uh, the colonies there? Mm -hmm. And so what it, what this time jump does is kind of several things. One, it allows the setting to be new for old players. They've advanced the setting. The ether is opened back up. What has changed? You can go to Mars and you'll recognize the cities and the factions but they've been cut off from Earth for a while. They're now back to their own independent. Um, you know, some of some of the cities like walled themselves off, and they're still loyal to Britain, uh, or you know, Belgium or wherever they're from. But others have been reconquered by uh, you know the Martians. Mm -hmm. uh, it, Venus, the the humans had to learn to either uh, adapt, make friends, or get wiped out. Uh, but it also makes a wonderful starting point for new characters who are like, hey, I just like Space 18, or I just like the idea of steampunk space adventures, but I don't want to have to go back and read 40 years of history. Cool. This is a new jumping off point. And we also have some, you know, if Space 18 and 9 uh, does well, which it's doing great on Kickstarter right now, there's always the chance for for more books and it i mean if you, you know, we've advanced the tam timeline 10 years so in world it's actually space 1899 mm -hmm. and that's only a couple of years away from you know the great war and what would the great war look like in you know a victorian steampunk setting that's sort of terrifying to me but i kind of want to see i kind of want to write that adventure yeah and <laughs> i th i think th to to be fair, what's certainly going to make things worse is well, is all the crazy ass tech that's already in space eighteen eighty nine, and then you add in an additional push in ter in terms of in terms of that, right? 
Just the just the idea of trying to imagine no man's land with some of that tech is nightmare oh, fuel. It's terrifying, yeah. <laughs> And it's not it's not like no man's land in World War One was sunshine and rainbows as it is. No, it was already like one of the worst things we've ever done to each other as humans. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I had I had recently I had recently rewatched um, All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, just about, the about a week ago. Um the more rec- I've seen the original, but I'm more referring to the remake to the remake that's on Netflix currently. Yes, I haven't watched that one yet. Uh both of them ha- both of them have their mer- have their merits and demerits i mm-hmm. am not i am not interested in 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 the which one's better debate because nope. no 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 <laughs> um i've i've said i've said before edition wars are cringe and re- and remake comparisons are equally cringe um as so- as somebody who's had to survive the sheer stupidity of D&D edition wars and the right. <laughs> Um, World of Darkness Edition War. Um, it is. It's just. It's just. Re- it's just really. Stu- it's just really stupid. But I think. I think the. The other. Th- the other thing that would make that kind of concept interesting is. The whole. Re- the whole reason. World War One start. Um, got so got so out of hand the way it did was because of the labyrinthine alliances that na- that nations all over Europe had. Right. It was a case of okay, okay, I am allied with you. If you go if you go and f- if you go to war, I will go to war against that same enemy. You multiply that about about 8 or 9 times. And that's all in the same vein some somebody had asked me a long time ago, would world if Franz Ferdinand was not assassinated? Would World mm-hmm. War One still still have happened? My answer is yes. It's just that something else would have set it off because oh the yeah, the powder thing... keg. The powder keg was there, and mm-hmm. as soon as as soon as Bismarck was removed from um, a position of power, he and several other key people were the ones tirelessly working behind the scenes to make sure that that powder keg didn't go off and when the warhawks removed them from removed their their influence their pacifying influence it was just a matter of time if it wasn't ferdinand it was going to be someone else it the was going to be uh, some other thing the sweet ir- the sweet maybe bittersweet irony of ferdinand's assassination is unlike unlike his father he he was he actually was pushing for reform of Aust- of um of the kingdom he was going to inherit he want since even though there were 11 nations who were under the the banner of austria hungary only the only two of them i think the germans and the hungarians had any real political power yeah whereas he wanted to reform it into a united states of austria hungary right and there's all, i've never been able to full to fully explore this, and maybe, and maybe when the time comes with space 80, 1889, I will. But I always, but I always wondered what if he, what if he survived and actually tried to make that reform and, and ended up causing a Austro-Hungarian civil war. Oh man, that would be. I see. That's a fun. That's a fun idea to, to explore. If you if you like this idea and want to like dig into it, uh, Donald Kagan. Uh, wrote a book called on the origins of war and the preservation of peace. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is he covers, he covers world war one, world war two, the Peloponnesian war, um, the Cuban missile crisis. And I think one more, mm-hmm. uh, it's been a while since I've read it, but he doesn't cover the war. He covers all of the reasons leading up to the war mm-hmm. because ever since, you know, Herodotus and, um, Thucydides, Every time we have a war, somebody's like, "Woof, this was awful. We will never do this again." <laughs> and we've spent more time as war at war as a species than we have enjoyed times of peace. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I suppose that I suppose that's the reason why you have that phrase "sic vis possum parabellum." Yes, <laughs> but. Of course, of course. I think I think trying to do the trying to do the Great War with with the tech level that's already present 
the big question you, that would have to be that would have to be asked is what equivalent sort of um, dreadnought effect would you have when you when um, something like ta something like tanks isn't going to be as much of a shocker when everybody's got sh everybody's got airships. Right, exactly. And then you know when you have liftwood and ether, and now we're not just talking about a world war; we're talking about uh, an inner systems war. Mm -hmm. Because allies are going to get drawn into it, because that's essentially what happened in World War One. It is a fascinating possibility. Yeah, and hell, when it came, when it came to the U.S., they they there was a whole lot of discussion about which side of the war they'd even they'd even jump in on. Right. Um, they only they only jo they only joined the side that they did w because because um they fe they felt that. For one, for one, French is, France was the home of democracy for a lot for a lot of Americans, and two, France is in debt is in debt to the U.S. Right. And three, well, there, well, a solution to some of the racial tensions going on was was to go, hey, maybe we give everybody something to shoot at. They'll stop. They'll stop bitching at each other. A noble idea in in theory, at the very least. Kind of, kind of hard to be yelling at each other when you're getting shot at. You know, there's, there's, there's something to be said for, and I, and I think that there is, there's an interesting. I won't get into it, but there's an interesting psychological discussion on the, uh, on the uniting power of hatred, and how that will, that will unify and co uh, cause a group to uh, cohesively bond to each other mm -hmm. far more powerfully than any other you know force that you know, yeah. that we we can we can bring to bear uh, on a culture and that's very terrifying to me yeah. now, as if, a, you know just a human mm -hmm. now if i do have to i do have to ask a bit of a lore question because sure, hit me. because since we're de now i obviously have the answer to this but this is a playing to the audience thing um, since we're dealing with, at the very least, interplanetary travel, um, you mentioned the ether. How ex how exactly would that work when it comes to going between planets? Because from what I from what I recall, we're still relatively in the solar system. We're not going into any f any far off planets. Inter no. That sort of travel isn't there yet. No, no. Uh, so essentially. It is a. It is technology. It is science fiction as the Victorians saw science fiction. Mm -hmm. So, the only planets we are able to go to, Mercury, Venus, the Moon, and Mars. The asteroid belt they believe is the remnants of a. Uh, the true fifth planet of the solar system called Phaeton, mm -hmm. but essentially because this is all still steampunk uh, no ship that has ventured beyond the asteroid belt has come back and that's because these are these ether ships are still working off of uh, solar boilers they're still steam powered mm -hmm. so beyond the asteroid belt there's uh, well the ether extends out so right space isn't a vacuum it's filled with you know this this ether uh, there's no way to power a ship currently beyond the asteroid belt Mm-hmm. So and and I get I get the feeling some people have tr have tried thinking thinking that their ship will be the one to do it, and they don't come back. Exactly. Because well, there's a reason Einstein's definition of insanity is still pre is still prevalent. Right. Doing the same thing uh, repeatedly and expecting a different outcome. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, ether works on a plane. All of the planets sit on the same plane, and if you deviate too far off that plane, the currents and the storms get very bad. So everyone kind of stays on the same plane. It works. I mean, it's it's again Victorian technology mm -hmm. uh, and Victorian view of the universe. So it works far more like sailing in in three dimensions than it works like what you would see in. Star Wars or Star Trek if, or if I had to use a contemporary example, although how contemporary this is 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 um 
something to take with a grain of salt. I'd probably make the comparison to Treasure Planet. Yes. Treasure Planet is a great reference point for Space 1889. Mm-hmm. Especially, especially since in that case the idea the idea of sa- of sails in space is is um t- is taken qu- taken quite literally in a lo- in in several cases. Um, right, exactly. I would bring up Spelljammer as well, but Spelljammer is fucking weird. <laughs> Spelljammer, you know what? I am I am not. So I have a deep and abiding love of all things second edition AD and D. Um. I still have my collection and slowly expand it as uh, Noble Knight and Drive Through RPG allow. But I want to be honest: out of all of the settings, I bounced hardest off of Spelljammer. There's a, I can un- I can understand that not just because of the weirdness of of the setting, because arguably there were weir- there were weirder settings, but more to do with how ridiculously un- unbalanced and just messy the books were. And it's believed that a lot of that has to do with um, Lorraine with the Lorraine Williams era. Oh man, we um, could talk about that as a whole podcast. Uh, I've... Because <laughs> my my uh, one of my business partners uh, at Strange Owl is uh, Timothy Brian Brown, mm-hmm. who did Dark Sun, worked at TSR. I love uh, Dark through... Sun to death. So <laughs> oh, I do too. Oh. Uh, and we we uh, you know he did Dragon Kings. Mm-hmm. So very excited about that as well. I've I've mentioned this in the past, but the there's a there's a handful of there's a handful of settings that I that I am very fond of from the from the set from the second edition days, which I know might sound might sound odd given my given my age, but I start I started when I was way too young to start. I was like ten years old when I first picked up a book. Oh. And that was only because I was obsessively going through cho- those old choose your own adventure books up to that. Oh point. yeah. Uh, but some, but a, f- a handful of the of of settings from second edition that I was fond of were, obviously I mentioned uh, Dark Sun, because when you're surrounded by force and so many ideas of fantasy, um, going into a desert is is going to be quite novel. Right. Um, Al Quadim, mm-hmm. and I, the setting that introduced the idea of the spell thief to me, which I have used in one form or another ever since. The Sahir is good is good as well, but the spell thief cap captured a whole lot of imagination for me. Okay. Um, and birthright. Oh man, birthright. Birthright hit at just the perfect time. I was just getting into sort of medieval history, and I was a big fan of the 90s uh, Highlander TV show. Mm. And so those two things combined, I still have all of my Birthright boxes and have run many a game. um, Many a game. And the domain play was just great, and the mass combat was good enough for jazz. And, um, man... Uh, one of one of the coolest uh, when I started doing I do the iconic podcast that was mm-hmm. kind of one of the ways I got into into gaming and Rich Baker did a we we had him on the show to talk about his primeval campaign setting which he had done for Thirteenth mm-hmm. Age and several other games you know kind of Conan meets Cthulhu yeah and I've um, I've I've made it clear in the past but myself and and my colleagues love Thirteenth Age to death. <laughs> Oh well, I I love Thirteenth Age, and I am uh, very excited about Thirteenth Age Second Edition coming out. Um, I'm I'm bouncing. I was bouncing back and forth whether or not this is a Second Edition or a or a Director's Cut. Um, I'm starting to lean more and more into it being a into it being a Second Edition with what I've been able to see mechanically. All right, so. Uh, I will try and only because again I'm I'm uh, you know the line developer for for the game so I'm going to try and say only what I know Rob had who is the game uh, designer Rob mm-hmm. and Jonathan have revealed mm-hmm. and mechanically everything most things I should say 
are backwards compatible. All of them. I don't think the monster math is changing um, at all. Uh, there wasn't a whole be, lot of math to change to begin exactly. with. Exactly. Uh, what is changing is they went back and they're looking at every class in the core book, mm -hmm. and they're saying, "What are feats and talents and abilities that either nobody picks or were underpowered, or they learned enough about the game to redesign?" And they're going to give a ton more advice, um, like just brilliant advice and, about icon relationships and how to use them. Yeah. Uh, kind of going back to our pre-show discussion about um, about aspects in Fate, and and I've frequently me... brought up that um, two-page spread regarding one unique thing, and said, "Right here, this is what you need to be doing. Right. If you're going to be giving somebody a, de if you're going to be giving your players a descriptive blank check, you need to make explicitly clear what is a good idea and what is not a good idea. Right, and." Every t every time I've seen one of those blank check I blank check concepts in RPGs, I will frequently bring that up, and I and I I don't bring I don't bring up Thirteenth Age in a fanboyism sense with this, but more of if 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 it was if it was so easy for 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 this for this game to put in to put in the details in the span of two pages, right? There is no excuse. Which a bit harsh, but I'm not paid. Hey, I'm not paid to be nice. I'm paid to tell the truth. There you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I I once I once told somebody who I whose work I was testing. I said, if you if you want somebody to, if you want somebody to kiss your ass, then go then go to the red light district. I'm here. To, I'm here to make your shit less shit. That, hey, you know what? We all need people like that in our life. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Getting getting back to now, obviously, there is, there is very little in the way of magic. Every everything is everything is tech. Exactly. Um, granted, granted, sometimes granted, sometimes you might have Clark's Law coming coming into coming exactly, into play. Exactly. Yep. Um, but I'd be remiss if I did not ask about um about ga about gadget creation because if you're dealing with this kind of setting. Being able to come up with cr with crazy doodads and inventions feels like a matter of course. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. So essentially, we have two different uh, types of... Um, so uh, kind of going back to one of your other things, we have full rules for ship creation. Uh, and when I, I let me rephrase that. Vehicle creation. From walkers to tracked vehicles to submarines to sailing ships to liftwood ships and ether flyers the imperium edition has rules for all of that we also have rules for devices which are assets that can be built by inventors um, they are marked by uh, components that you have to gather and certain uh, distinctions let you start with plans for some of these and they give you example components in there and they give you example of devices so that you can uh, use these examples to come up with your own as a as a game master or as a player saying, hey, I want to do X, what would I need to do to have that? And they give you a ton of different examples. And then we have uh, inventions, which work kind of similarly, but inventions are where uh, the true weirdness of the setting comes in. So... Um, it's more of an extended test. They can be unstable. And again, we have example plans for players to use as their guideposts going forward and making the weird thing. So things like invisibility cloaks, freeze rays, uh, conveyor packs, boilerplate juggernauts. Some of these came from Sky Galleons of Mars. And um, yeah, so there are the weird tech and the uh, the mad scientist inventions are a part of the game. Mm -hmm. And I've had I've I've certainly had to deal with some with some games who get who get a little bit overboard when it comes to the requirements of item creation. Looking right at you, um, thir third edition magic item creation. That was a. <laughs> So, 
if some if somebody if somebody wanted to do something ridiculous as say let's just go with something simple and say they want they want to make an electric gun there's probably yeah. there's probably ones already in the book but they want to make their version of it their version of the electric gun yeah mm-hmm. you know because they played quake once that's right <laughs> that one time in college so how in that in that particular case would it be relatively easy for them to um, make the make the required checks in order to make in order to make the thing and possibly customize it. Oh yeah. So essentially, um, each uh, the GM would define which two components make up this device, and they're basically connected to different types of science cascades. So you have automaton, biology, chemistry, ether, mechanisms, or physics, and then essentially. And they give you some example components uh, that you can draw from. And then it would just be working with your GM on how to say, all right, how does this differ from a regular gun? Do you want to have it have extended range? Do you want to have it, uh, you know, it's got to be powered by a battery. So you'd be able to take those and build those into the assets. And every asset you're building into the in uh, the device, you know, it raises the the cost, if you will, of making it. Uh, but again, as you said earlier, you know this is like two pages worth of advice per type of you know device versus invention. So we're really relying on uh, game balance being at the table. You know here are, here are the guidelines and here are the examples and here are the rules. But we're not going to you know we're not going as you said uh, third edition magic item creation where here is an entire. Uh, subsection of the book dedicated to what you may want to do. Yeah, and um, I bring that up as an as an easy whipping boy because because if because um if somebody wanted to make a custom magic item, there was either there was either go through chart hell, and I've done my time with chart hell playing er, playing early role master. I'm not going back. <laughs> or. That, or there is the just narrativeize it, and both of those are swinging the pendulum too far the other way. Right. So this kind of this kind of falls more on the narrative side, but mm-hmm. more towards the midpoint between the two, as yeah. opposed to just pick some things out of the ether, if you will. Mm-hmm. And these. And when it comes to when it comes to these sort when it comes to these sorts of devices, I be rem- one of my players lo- one of my players loves throwing bombs, quite literally. So I'm guess I'm guessing it'd be relatively easy for them to cr- for them to craft their own bo- their own bombs if they w- if they want to have a Victorian equivalent of Greek fire, right? Because his his, appro- his approach is um. Is there's there is no such there's no such thing as as um fr- as friendly fire. <laughs> there's ju- there's just fire. There's just fire. That's right. Uh, which is which is why he, which is why he was not allowed to play that character when during one um, session where it had where we had to be stealthy. He's he he protested by saying I'm I'm plenty st- I'm plenty stealthy I can be quiet. I looked at I looked at him. I said nothing for about ten seconds. Just just with the bl- just with the blank stare where you know somebody's full of shit, but you don't want to say anything. Right. The uh huh sure. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna call you on this. Uh. So inst- instead we had hit instead we had him do the storm the front thing while everybody else does the sneaky part. And afterwards he's like, "I was stealthy. See, they're all dead. Nobody can sound the alarm if they're all dead." Um, I mean, you can't deviate from plan the plan if there's no one to uh, to force a deviation. Yeah, it was it was a case where I I I I I just <laughs> I just, I just gra- I just grabbed I just grabbed the nearest drink that I hadn't chugged because I was like god, <laughs> god damn it I hate you so much for this. You know, I appreciated his um his creativity, but at the same time, fuck you. 
<laughs> I think we've I think we've all had that person at one point. We we it technically worked, but at the same time, I hate how you did it. Right. Exactly. Now, a lot of games have some sort of extra effort or met or meta currency or or the like. Shadowrun has edge. Um, World of Darkness has willpower. D and D Fourth Edition had action points. Some say Fifth Edition has it with inspiration. I don't agree with that. It's wait. It's way too loose. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sim? Do you have a similar limited limited resource that can we do that can apply in oomph? Yeah. So we have Cogs uh, because it's a steampunk setting, mm -hmm. um, and so a Cog is our meta currency. So there's two. There's two. Let's call it components to the cog. Mm -hmm. So let me pull this up here. You you know you eventually hit that point uh, where you have have so many games either you're designing or that you've read that you're like yes, but I can't call up the specific right now because it's blending with several other meta currencies that I'm playing with. You uh, so have no idea how de how deep that rabbit hole goes with me. Right. Me. If you were to if you were to look through my library, you'd be like, I can't count that high. That's right. Um, so uh, when you spend a cog, you get to re-roll any dice in your uh, in your die pool. So that's that's useful in the fact that you could even re-roll dices that come up fives in hopes that you can you can get a six. Now the other use that a cog gives you is it allows you to activate a power action on any um, uh, initiative card, any order mm -hmm. card, or outside of combat, when you, you know, if you just want to pick that guy up and drop him in the middle of the streets of London, it costs you a cog because mm -hmm. there's no order cards. Now, you get cogs back. You always start each adventure with three. Now, each character has two traits. And, you know, traits are, let's, you know, they're much like the... Mm -hmm. uh, you're from, you mentioned World of Darkness, so I'm going to assume you're familiar with nature and demeanor. Yes. All right, so you have two things like you have two uh, personality traits. And so essentially each trait comes with an expression and a temptation. And every time you propose a temptation to get you into trouble because of your trait, the GM awards you with a cog. And every time you play the trait, and when I say every time, I mean once per adventure. So essentially, you start with three, and if you're really playing your character's traits, you can earn two more for playing your traits, and you can earn another two for putting, uh, allowing the GM to screw with the story because of your actions due to your trait. So, for example, if you are demanding, um, you know. Every time you when you get your way, despite it providing a detriment to the crew, you get a cog. And then every time you being demanding causes a problem for the crew, you can say, "Ooh, you know, say you're standing um, in the Imperium Society and they want you to do something one way, and you're going to demand that you do it another way, knowing that they're probably going to toss you out or you know dock you uh, some reward." You could offer that to the GM as, hey, this is where my trait's going to get me into trouble. I'd like to earn another cog here. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with that in mind, uh, one of the uh, one of the one of the common things that it, that has that has to be asked when you have all these moving parts is le is lethality. I've mm -hmm. I've mentioned I've mentioned L five R in the past, and Legend of the Five Rings is infamous for how lethal its combat can get. Largely yeah, because you're get... walking around with a three foot razor blade, like. Well, that it's... that and and um, you shouldn't be get you shouldn't be getting into combat at the drop of a hat. Right. And it's be it is beating you over the head with the fact that this is not this is not this is not D and D meets Japan. Right, there are other exactly. there are other games that will there are other games that will do that. This this has far more in common with Game of Thrones in that it is political intrigue first and foremost. 
obviously not as many severed heads, but the point still stands. Right, exactly. So when it comes to space when it comes to space 1889 after do you consider it to be high or low on the end of lethality um you know it's lower on the level of lethality it's not saying you can't die but it is far easier to be removed from combat due to your injuries to be stunned to be knocked out to be down than it is to be killed that being said on a roll of a one on the injury table, uh, you're dead. You you die at the end of the exchange, and you uh, nothing nothing avoids that. Now on the on the you know to add to that is weapons will inflict an injury, but they'll also on a pair inflict wounds. And like I said, if you have three wounds and you get injured, you're rolling four d twenty, and picking the lowest number on the d20s making the chances you're going to get a one much higher now we do have because this is a victorian kind of high adventure game there is the chance that you can um declare a last stand um you basically get to uh perform heroic last deeds that, you know, you know, if you're going to die, you can consider taking a last stand. And basically, you get to say, all right, I'm going to die, but here is here is this amazing thing that I'm going to do in the middle of this fight. Um, you can, you know, your deed can, you know, route all the mooks or take out a unit or a villain. You can take somebody with you, essentially. Because, right, this is Reichenbach Falls. All right, well... I'm going out, but I'm taking Moriarty with me. Uh, sort of heroism, if you will. Yeah, I can, I can, I can certainly get that. And in doing, in doing that, it, it fully lines up with a key part of my philosophy. That is rules add drama. Yes. I know that some people are like are like rules are the devil and like no they're not the devil they're not the angel either. Uh, whenever I run Call of Cthulhu, I explain that the dice care for you about as much as the elder gods do, which is to say, they do not, and, and <laughs> they're going to do what they do despite any uh, emotional attachment you have, and that's really where you know my my table says. The, the the mantra that I've tried to instill at my at my tables because I am not a killer DM but I don't shy away from deaths. I'm like the dice tell a story, and if you get everything you want at the end of the campaign and you've made no sacrifices and you've won every fight, did you really have any agency in the campaign? Mm -hmm. Now, with the with that in mind. I know I know you mentioned not want not wanting to bog people down in and and have and having them do 40 years worth of catch up but I'm curious mm -hmm. if you do have plans on putting a a um su a summarized version of the timeline leading up to the events of after There is a there is a summarized version of the timeline in the core rulebook Mhm mm The and to follow to follow up with that I've since I keep I keep mentioning L5R and this is going to be another case of it um, I remember back when fourth edition was being developed, and they wanted to not ha not have the core book as married to to the time to the timeline in the setting. Oh yeah, I remember that. Like I loved L five R fourth edition, but mm -hmm. the fact that you know you had what was it Annals of the Empire volume one and two, where it's like here's all the different variants of L five R you could like you know pieces of the timeline that you could set yeah. it in. Yeah, yeah. because. One one of the bit one of the big examples of an issue that happened in um in third edition is let's say let's say you want to run a campaign that takes place in the Four Winds era, mm -hmm. and one of the people there wants to be a Daidoji, so you gr so you grab the revised third edition book and there's no Daidoji because the Daidoji were wiped out, mm -hmm. even in the at that point in the at that point in the story. Even though they weren't wiped out in the Four Winds era, 
So you'd have to dig around for may maybe the original third edition book if you were if you were lucky by that point, but you shouldn't really have to. Right. Now where this com where this comes in when it comes to space is, do you have plans on su on putting in support for if people want to want to run this rule set in past points in the timeline? We don't have any specific support, but one of the nice things about um, what Daryl did with Space 1889 is he tried to make, like, say, for example, the the creature section and the the space, you know, the, the, the threats section as broadly inspired by the previous editions. We've had a lot of questions from people asking, hey, are you going to do conversion guide? Are you going to you know, do X, Y, and Z? And at this plan time, there's no real plan for that because what's really changed about the setting is covered in the setting section. So if you like Ubiquity or you love Savage Worlds or you love the old GDW system, you're going to be able to take all of the changes that we've made there and run with it. And if you're a big fan of the old setting but don't want to jump to space, you know, to 1899, you can still take these rules and use them with your old books. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a little bit of conversion uh, involved there. You're either going to have to make up new new creatures and, and threats or, you know, squint real hard when you look at your old GDW books. But no real plans at this point to do anything um, reverse compatible, if you will. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the book? Uh, so at, I, so one of the things that we wanted to do, uh, what we want to do with Strange Owl Games is as close to when the game is, uh, when the Kickstarter closes and the funds are dispersed, we want to be able to give our backers the text immediately. So we have a version of the text that is, I would say, it's not edited yet. Part of it is we're, we're going to be doing a tribal edit with the people who have backed uh, before it goes into our final editing. And we have some more art to put in here. But right now we're sitting at 348 pages. Mm -hmm. And I'm... Um... Obviously, obviously, the P obviously the PDF when the time comes will be properly bookmarked. I know oh, that's yes. I know that no, seems no, no. a redundant thing, but I have had a few cases where that didn't happen, and I had to call it out. No, we will. Uh, it's already bookmarked. <laughs> I will make sure that that is preserved going forward. On uh, in in subsequent versions, and that's going to be the same thing for all of our. This is going to be the same thing for all of our uh, new products going forward. We've already announced that we're going to be doing um, a game uh, coming to Kickstarter here second quarter 2023, uh, Amboria, The World Under Starlight. It's going to be using the Clash system, which I developed for my Jackals game. Um, and the text is, again, 95% done. It's going to be fully written by the time the Kickstarter goes live. So we want to make sure that People who back the Kickstarter are getting things, maybe not the final product. You know, there's going to be more art added. There's going to be, you know, play <coughs> test tweaks. But if you back one of our Strange Owl products, you're going to get a playable version of the game within, you know, several weeks of the Kickstarter closing. We don't want to go to Kickstarter and say, hey, if you guys like this, then we'll make this game. We believe in our games and our designers enough to say, hey, this game is ready. If you want it, come to our Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get behind that. And what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a the final PDF will ballpark. go to backers. Yeah, the PDF will go to backers in uh, in March. So that'll be the final laid out version with. Uh, art and bookmarks, and I'm hoping to also hyperlink the 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 PDF. Uh, we've got some great margin um, use where we reference rules and other things, and I'm, we're working on getting all of that 
so that if it says, hey, COGS, see page 147, you're going to be able to click on that sidebar in the PDF and have it jump to page 147 for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have a, we're hoping to deliver the physical versions of the book no later than September of this year, or sorry, of next year. Mm-hmm. September of this year would be a feat worthy. I wouldn't be in game design if I could deliver something in September of this year. <laughs> no, you no. Um, I would. I would ask. I would ask why. Why you have my DeLorean? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. But although, to, although to be fair, there's pl there's plenty of open road in Vegas, so you probably could get it up to eighty eight miles an hour. Yeah, pretty easily. You just end up causing a blackout to ha to <laughs> half of the strip. It's fine. I'm it's sure fine. The fine. the all the Tony Clifton impersonator impersonators will be perfectly fine for at least for at least a few minutes. Was that too deep of a cut? <laughs> no, no, I'm giggling over here. <laughs> like you, ex people expected me to go with Elvis. No, I'm going with I'm going with Tony Clifton. <laughs> Because apparently there's still people pr pretending to be that guy. Man. But I, there you go. But with that, with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Oh, it's my pleasure. This was awesome. I enjoyed chatting with you beforehand, and I enjoyed uh, uh, talking with you about Space 1889, and hopefully as new. Uh, New games come from uh, come out from Strange Owl, or you know, if I you know if you want to talk Thirteenth Age Second Edition sometime, or I've got another little small game uh, coming out from Osprey called Urban Decay. I'd love to come back on and chat about any of them. Yep. Uh, well, I don't I don't want to spend I don't want to have eyes bigger than my stomach, but we but <laughs> that's something that we can we can arrange one at a time. Uh, Perfect. And of course, any anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I will be prepared for our next one. Mm -hmm. I'll have a gl nice glass of scotch with me. Oh, scotch. Good man. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>